Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us as we re-kick off our uh, community call series after the summer break. Hope everybody enjoyed the summer. Um, so today we have uh, with us, we have a special guest um, speaker. We have Paloma Marin Areza, Areza so apologies, <laughs> Areza. Um, so Paloma is the Associate Director of Engagement at ORCID, and today she's going to be exploring the collaboration between ORCID and the Open Air Graph and Open Air. And we'll also look into some tools that you can use um, to help increase discoverability and enhance metadata. So as always, um, we ask you to please keep your microphones muted during the presentation to avoid any background noise. At the end, we'll have about 30 minutes for a discussion where we'll give you the floor to ask any questions. Um, I'm going to send in the chat the Google Doc uh, so you can write your questions either here in the Zoom Q&A or in the Google Doc, which I'm going to send now. And any questions we don't get to today, we'll answer directly in the document. So first, let me share that with you all here. Okay. All right. So here we go. All right. So that is sent. And then I think we can uh, just jump right into it for about five minutes in. So we might have people still filtering in a little bit later, but we'll get started. So with that, I'll hand the floor over to Paloma. Thank you very much, Alana, and um, Open Air in general for inviting us, ORCID, to this um, uh, call today. Um, I'm very happy to uh, be here today, although I have to say that I'm a bit swollen due to an, um, a surgery that I had yesterday. So if I sound a bit weird or you don't get what I'm saying, just please let me know. And I'm more than happy to repeat things. Let me uh, now share the presentation I prepared for um, our call today, uh, which, as Alana was mentioning, um, is going to explore a bit the collaboration between um, ORCID and uh, OpenAir, but also some details that might be um, of help uh, for you in case you are planning to integrate ORCID in other instances. So first of all, what we are going to cover today is a general overview of ORCID um, that you're probably more than familiar with. Um, I'm seeing some uh, familiar names uh, among the participants, but it, it will be nice uh, to have anyways a kind of reminder. Um, then um, some ideas in terms of the collaboration of ORCID and OpenAir, also from a timeline perspective. And then um, I will cover more the different uh, integrations that uh, OpenAir has with, uh, with ORCID and how ORCID is used in those contexts. And then as Alana was mentioning, we are going to have some Q&A, uh, some time for, for Q&As. So um, again, as said, you're probably more than familiar with ORCID, but uh, ORCID is an independent, not-for-profit uh, organization that is open uh, to participation by all. And the registry per se, so that list of ORCID IDs together with the information, was launched in 2012. We are guided by our values and funding principles and committed to making fair open data available. And this is done uh, mostly via our public API, but also our annual public data file or public data file sync that I will cover later because this is one of the uh, usage of uh, ORCID among open air and particularly the open air graph. And um, if you see our community right now, this data is slightly uh, outdated. So the, the number is a bit higher um, now, but it's co it covers mostly uh, universities and research institutions, but also some publishers, funders, um, uh, service providers, and policy makers and government institutions. So the adoption worldwide um, is quite broad. Uh, we currently have um, 60 uh, members in 60 countries and um, 29 national uh, consortium. One of those is a regional consortium. So currently there are over um, 1,400 uh, member organizations and, and almost 6,000 right now um, integrations with ORCID. 
and um and then uh we have um almost a a uh, almost 9 million uh, users uh, that are active yearly this means that they use their orchid id to connect with systems uh, or to add information to their own um, record in general orchid provides uh, three services uh, related to the infrastructure first of all is the orchid id that you are uh, familiar with for sure, and it is this uh, 16 um, alphanumeric character um, code that identify a researcher. Then um, we also have the ORCID record, which is this profile or the information attached to that ORCID ID. This includes affiliation data, such as employment, education, professional activities, funding, peer review, research outputs and also other metadata. So we need to think of the ORCID record beyond that publication list that sometimes is associated with, with the record. And last but not least, the key piece of the infrastructure is the API. Um, and we have a set of APIs being the public API and the member API that allows the connection with um, this system. So we have an institutional system connected to ORCID via the, uh, the API. So this uh, allows the authentication of researchers um, and the data reading if you're using the public API and also authentication, data reading, data writing, and synchronization if you're using the member API. Um, in general, uh, this looks like this uh, from a public um, perspective. So if you, if you resolve an ORCID record, this is what you can find. And recently, um, actually at the end of uh, last year, we included the visualization of a summary, which is all the details that are relevant from the ORCID record, including some key dates, like when was the uh, record created and last time updated. We included everything in what we call the record summary, and we expect this information to be also useful for organizations reading uh, the data, member organizations in this case. So the vision of ORCID is a, a world where all who participate in research, scholarship, and innovation are uniquely identified and connected to their contributions effort, uh, across disciplines, borders, and time. This is actually important because sometimes we tend to think of um, ORCID users are, as exclusively researchers, but there uh, can be people that are not associated with a research institution that still participate or collaborate somehow in research, scholarship and innovation that can be identified by an ORCID ID. And we are going to get to that point, uh, enabling transparent and trustworthy connections between those research and people uh, involved in research, their contributions and affiliations with that unique identifier. So now let's see how this has evolved uh, together with Open Air, so in the collaboration. Um, before 2020, um, the uh, ORCID, um, ORCID was used in Open Air through the, oh, sorry, through the public API. And then in 2020, Open Air became an ORCID member, and there is where the usage of the member API and other um, activities um, started. So also in 2020, um, Opener started using the uh, public data file synchronization in the Opener research graph. And we are going to uh, cover a bit more of that uh, later when I describe a bit more what this public um, data file is. Uh, but also you have a, a blog that we published also in 2020 with institutional usage uh, of that uh, public data file being um, the research, uh, the um, open air research graph, one uh, of those. And then in 2021, also what we call search and linguist uh, was launched, in this case with Open Air Explore. And this is one of the tools you can find in uh, the ORCID record uh, to um, include uh, publications to the, or to the ORCID record. So it's a way to facilitate a, a work claiming, so to say, among uh, researchers. And then 
um, um, Opener also developed Argos as a uh, DMP uh, tool or DMP platform in order to create data management plans and um, or to be using that platform. But it is not about the infrastructure only. It is also about different collaborations in webinars um, that we have had with Opener particularly through the different opener nodes. For example, this past January with the uh, node in, in Austria. And I added this um, a light bulb there because uh, of course I'm more than open to suggestions and other things that uh, we can do together because this is also a important platform, a community call to describe a bit more of that. Since uh, uh, particularly this last year, but also since um, we uh, initiated the initiative work, it uh, we better documented our integration best practices. Also, according to the systems where Orchid is mostly integrated, um, and this includes discovery systems such, an, uh, such as uh, Opener Explorer. So basically, um, we realized that most institutions were using Orchid in either a repository. A, um, a CRIS or a RIM system, depending on geographically where you are, um, ERA system, um, um, uh, manuscript submission system, and grant uh, system, so, and discovery systems as well. So basically, we structure our best practices around these type of systems and the usage of WordGuide we've observed in our community. So in the case of discovery systems, what we have is that they enable a wide, a wide range of end users to find and obtain insights about scholarly information. And this is actually what happens with uh, Open Air Explorer. And the, the, the best practices that we've um, aligned to that usage is, of course, the authentication of ORCID um, IDs and the permission collection you are um, you know that in order to interact with an ORCID record or populate an ORCID record, user permissions are uh, extremely important. Also, this aligns with the data-driven, uh, sorry, um, a user-driven approach that we have within uh, ORCID. And this consent is also crucial in aspects like GDPR, for example. Um, then, um, once the uh, the user is authenticated, then either with the ORCID ID or names containing the ORCID record, information about that person can be um, can be connected. This uh, will also enable to find uh, uh, contributions in that particular discovery system. Then uh, what we also recommend for discovery systems is that they keep the items added to ORCID records up to date with changes so that the researcher doesn't have to go every single time and claim updates. And discovery system that creates their own researcher uh, profile or author cluster must provide an option to researchers that continues to update the researcher's ORCID record over time. Um, and again, the uh, display of ORCID IDs should be uh, according to our uh, guidelines. So in this case, millions of researchers are presented with the option of retrieving words from Open Air Explore following some of the steps that I already described. So if someone goes to the ORCID record, they will find um, the search and linguist set option, Open Air, then there is a authentication page um, as you see here, and then the name of the person, in this case, my name, is used to find works that are within uh, Opener. For example, um, this is one uh, of, the, uh, of the works that are related to my name and my ORCID ID. And I can claim and add that work to ORCID, which results in the work with the corresponding um, DOIs or any other identifier that might be there added to the profile, including the source via uh, Opener Explore. Another case of uh, usage of ORCID uh, within um, Opener and Opener uh, services is uh, the public um, 
record data that is available as part of the public data file. Uh, if an organization like Open Air is a member of ORCID, then um, the, the file can also be synchronized daily. So the public data file in general is a way to support broad access to the ORCID registry information for the research community. Once a year, um, during the Open Access Week, we publish this data. Um, and there, this is uh, a um, file containing public data, uh, record data in XML. We also have a conversion library in case um, institutions or researchers, because this is open for the research community in general, would like to work with um, JSON. The data is available under a CC0 license and, um, and, can be, uh, and can be used. And as mentioned, a daily synchronization is available for premium member organizations. And this is the one used by, by OpenAir. Uh, for um, the general community, the, uh, the file is available once a year. So the, uh, here you have a screenshot from the 1 2023, and um, in October, we will publish the one for 2024 and so on. And it is actually very important because uh, one of the potential usage of unauthenticated ORCID IDs this is, if I go back to um, slides, um, IDs that haven't gone through this process here in the, uh, in the screenshot in the middle, right? So simply you collect that uh, ORCID ID from another source and this other source can be the public data file. And we know that large database uh, integrations, for example, Open Air Explore, harvest this data from the public data file and use this data to enhance um, their own data. And these can help matching authors and researchers with, the, um, with their outputs or other information available within ORCID. So uh, the, as mentioned, ORCID data is used um, as part of the open air um, graph as one of the instrumental uh, data sources um, detailed also in the different uh, graphs. And uh, the, uh, the usage in general is that um, the ORCID records are going to be matched to other publications and then import information from ORCID uh, that is not already available in the graph. Then uh, another point that I wanted to discuss is the uh, data management plans, which are probably not as common in terms of um, research outputs as maybe an article or as well uh, known, but can help define responsibilities for data. Not only explain what you plan to do during, the, um, during your research project with the data, but also the data responsibilities, especially in projects involving different institutions. And then identifying, as mentioned, researchers and contributors within those data management plans is key. Um, so one aspect that is quite important of this usage in Argos is that ORCID IDs are securely shared as part of Argos. So there is an authentication process um, occurring with ORCID whenever you sing in into Argos. And you see exactly here what uh, the organization is going to do with the ORCID ID. In this case, get the ORCID ID. Um, ORCID in, case, uh, in, the, in the framework of Argos can also play an important role in the main information section that uh, contains 2.3 uh, researchers, people that have produced, processed, analyzed the data described in the data management plan, and also uh, the contact 1.6. Um, the, the part about researchers is also very important because uh, last year, we in, two years ago actually, we included uh, the credit taxonomy as part of our 
metadata. So if uh, we have different researchers collaborating in a, in a data management plan or in the data uh, generated as part of a project or any other output like publications or software, etc., then we can perfectly define the role that they've um, carried out as part of this, uh, of this project. So if they've collected the data, if they have analyzed the data, if they've written the, the final code, uh, et cetera. So there are a total of 14 roles that the person can, can have. And then, of course, as mentioned, related to the responsibilities, it's also important to determine correctly who is the, the main contact person and what they can do related to that um, data management plan and the data generated as part of the of the uh, project connected to that data management plan. So some best practices that can be considered for data uh, management plan platforms to add visibility and recognition to um, those uh, data management plans which, by the way, are a type of work that can be added to, to the ORCID record. So not only saying, yeah, I participated here, but also it can be added. Sync in with ORCID. It's a very important option. is provided uh, in Argos and also in other DMP platforms available out there. Um, then it is important to collect authenticated IDs for contributors as well. So not only the main, um, the, the, the person writing that uh, DMP or the principal investigator, but also other people as included here, researchers, other people that might have an impact in, in the data described as part of this data management plan. Um, the, the correct uh, ID display, and then um, the resulting data management plans being added to the ORCID record and uh, included in the metadata pass downstream, which is quite normal. If you are, for example, connecting that data management plan with a repository, for example, in order to connect the, the final uh, data set with the data management plan. And particularly if we are having a machine, machine actionable DMP approach, then uh, that, these, uh, that the ORCID ID is resolvable and data that might be important for, for that um, data management plan can be populated from ORCID records. That include at the end, a summary of a person related data. And this can be always applicable in, in the case of a data management plan. Uh, and with that, I finished the general overview of how ORCID is used currently in, in open air. Uh, and I'm more than happy to answer questions that are either in the chat or in the, um, in the other documents. And I thank you all very much for, for your participation today and, and for listening. Great, thank you so much. All right, so uh, we'll move over uh, to our Q&A session now. Um, so again, feel free to write your questions in the Google Doc that was shared in the chat. Um, you can also type them here in the Q&A or in the Zoom chat as well. Um, so we'll just start off first, just if anybody, uh, let me just make sure I can see you all had their hand raised. I see no hands. So we can go to, we have uh, a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, the first is while adding articles using DOIs, ORCID sometimes encounters difficulties correctly retrieving symbolic math characters, for example, Greek letters or special symbols. Is there any ongoing research or application of the AI technologies aimed at improving the accuracy of retrieving and displaying these characters? Thank you very much for um, this question. Um, this is um, actually not really uh, related to a, uh, or I mean, there is no ongoing research uh, thinking of applying AI technologies or anything like that, but it, this is more related with the ENCODE formatting. So when we see this type of, um, of issues, what uh, we do is check in with the source, usually uh, Crossref, but also any other uh, DOI agency so that this information is corrected. Um, it doesn't happen uh, 
only with Greek letters or uh, letters from other alphabets, uh, but also if you are uh, with the Latin alphabet in and, and you have non-English characters like the accents or tilts uh, that you might uh, find in Spanish, Portuguese, um, some Slavic languages and so on. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, so there's, uh, we have uh, three questions from this participant. The second is, is the ORCID API freely available for nonprofit organizations, specifically government entities to use? Um, yes. Um, yes and no. So just to be clear, there are two uh, ORCID um, APIs or two ways of, of accessing the ORCID API. The first one is the public API and considering their name, it's completely public. However, it will be always associated with a personal ORCID ID. So there is no possibility to create a, uh, an ORCID ID for an organization and then create a public ID, um, uh, sorry, public API credential set. It will be always linked to an individual. Um, as part of the documents that you shared earlier, Alane, I can also add the links um, to the relevant documentation in case this is useful for for organizations. Uh, so yeah. there, there, uh, and with the public API, it is possible to authenticate researchers and also read publicly available data within those records. Um, as part, uh, uh, um, apart from that, there is a member API and the member API is available for member organizations that pay an annual fee to work it. And for them, it is not only possible to read data from ORCID records, but also write data and keep uh, records synchronized. Um, so that will be uh, the answer. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then the third one is, uh, is it possible for researchers to hide their ORCID profiles from the public while still allowing access to specific organizations such as the university or research institute? And if so, yes. how can this be implemented? Um, this is possible. Uh, and actually, this is a very uh, interesting question, also sometimes related to GDPR. So uh, when someone registers for an ORCID ID, um, in, the, uh, in the registration, one can select exactly the visibility settings one uh, desires for the whole record. This can be public by default, uh, trust parties by default, or only me, private, by default. Um, this applies to every single data entries within the record. So for example, if I add uh, um, that my record is publicly available, then um, if, when I connect with another uh, system and this system adds data to my ORCID record, this will be only private sorry, only uh, public for everyone. However, I can decide in every single item uh, what uh, I which visibility I want for that item. For example, my complete record might be public, but then I want that only uh, a couple of works are available for only me or only for trust parties. So if, you're, uh, if the, the visibility of the record is private and then you connect with a certain institution, the information that this institution adds to your ORCID record is going to be private. And you can decide if you make part of that uh, public to certain parties or uh, public to everyone. Um, then um, another possibility is that your, um, your ORCID record is trust parties and by default, so only the organizations you connect with are going to be able to read the data that you have that you have there. Um, I hope this clarifies. Uh, if not, I can detail a bit more the different visibility settings and and potential connections in in the document that that Alan is there, shared. Great, thanks. And then we'll go in and um, <clears throat> pull a couple from the document itself. So we have, um, what is an active researcher and what is an activity? 
Yeah, um, active researchers are considered those researchers that um, are using um, ORCID. And let me explain this. Basically, uh, when ORCID was created, we were counting the, the total number of ORCID ID that were registered. And in fact, that was not very accurate because some people created the record and never used it or um, there were uh, some spam records. This is being solved already, but we had a bit of those situations. So we consider an, a record active. If in the period of a year, this record has been used to either sync in with another application, uh, if uh, it has a connection to, a, to another system, or if data has been added either via a, a system integration or manually. That's in general the, the parameter. And uh, an activity is basically in, in an ORCID record, every single uh, item that is added to the record. And is, it is not only publications, but an activity can be an affiliation entry or a funding item entry, or even a peer review. Okay, thanks. Um, and then a second one um, from the from the document we have just to clarify the public data file is available yearly for every organization to use this data on their own systems. Can you elaborate on what is shared in this file? Absolutely. So uh, basically, it's available once a year for everyone uh, in the in, in publicly. And for member organizations that are premium member organizations, it's available even daily if, if that organization would like to connect. And basically it contains all the data that are public uh, on ORCID records from everywhere. So um, every single data item that is public on the ORCID record will be included in the public data file. And this has uh, information from every single section affiliations, um, funding, works, professional activities, etc. I can also, by the way, link the, the, the uh, public data file policy as well in the document after the call. Yeah, it'd be really helpful, I think, for any of the links. Um, yeah, I think it'd be really helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, so we do have a couple more in the Q&A. Um, so we have... <laughs> Researchers want their peer reviews to appear on their ORCID profiles. I know that it should be provided by the publisher and that it is then an automatic procedure. Is there any example of a small publisher other than the big ones that have implemented this opportunity? Um, yes, yeah, so we have medium size uh, publishers, for example, uh, uh, Carger, that have implemented this, uh, but also some um, institutional um, institutional uh, uh, journal publishing platforms, like um, uh, the ones using OGS, they have this, uh, this option as well available. Um, so what we don't have at the moment is small independent journals uh, using it. We have um, small journals, but that are part of an institutional uh, OGS platform. Also, there is the possibility for researchers to um, have their work around, so to say, using um, a Web of Science. So Web of Science has a profile when, uh, where researchers can, um, can add their, their uh, peer review activities and have them verified. And then through the uh, open, open uh, Web of Science uh, connection to, to ORCID, they can share also those peer reviews. This was part of the functionality that Publons offered in the past. And where uh, when Publons was acquired by, by Web of Science, it converted into a Web of Science functionality. My, my ORCID record is an example of that. So every uh, peer review activity that I have is um, uh, was added via, via Web of Science. Thanks. Um, and then we have one that's a bit more for the, the open air tech team. So is there any news in um, propagating ORCID through OAI or PMH with the DC scheme? I don't know if that's something 
were able to answer. Claudia, thank you. Yes, I think I can answer this one. Uh, well, Opener dismissed uh, the OAPMH service some years ago. Uh, it was not possible to deliver it uh, at full potential uh, for various reasons. So at the moment, uh, I mean, I'm not getting into the details of, of the motivations, but at the moment is not in the plan to, to reintroduce it. So what I can reassure about is the availability of the ORCID identifiers um, obtained uh, also thanks to the collaboration with ORCID uh, in the public API that OpenAid delivers that do not respond OEIDC format. Uh, we have an ongoing activity to, uh, let's say, renovate uh, the response format, the way the API is organized, and I can reassure that ORCIDs are, will be there. Uh, so apart from the works that uh, OpenAid gets from the ORCID uh, profiles, uh, the ORCIDs are also distributed to uh, the other works because you know open air runs the application against uh, the works themselves so uh, the possibility to get uh, or kids from an authoritative source allows to uh, enrich also the other records that open air gathers so uh, this uh, added value will be uh, given back through the open air apis thanks if I can add something to the answer given by Claudio, we also have um, an enrichment step during the pipeline of the construction of the graph that uh, uh, associates ORCID to results that do not have, but are linked together by strong semantic relationship, for example, is supplemented by if they found um, the same author names. So if you uh, have a publication and there is the ORCID identifier for uh, some of the authors and this publication, for example, is linked via, is a supplemented by relationship to a data set and uh, some of the authors of the data set are the same of the publication and do not have the ORCID identifier, OpenAir tries to uh, add the identifier also to the authors of the data set. They are black ORCID identifier and not green, but... Meaning not confirmed, but still suggested. Yes. Perfect, thanks. And then we have a follow-up on the peer review question. So is integration with Janeway in the plans? I really like this question because uh, we actually had a call with the Janeway team. I think it was like three weeks ago or something like that, um, and precisely to discuss the ORCID integration and not only the ORCID integration, but a potential certification of Janeway as a, a manuscript submission system. And uh, it is planned. However, um, it is not uh, clear when exactly this will happen. But the idea is that uh, once the work integration is available in um, in J in J and in way, it's available with the whole functionality. So the possibility of adding publications and also the possibility of adding peer reviews. If the University of Hand is uh, interested in um, in that um, Genway and the functionality, I will take note of that uh, because I'm, I'm always collecting use cases. I know that um, the Technical University of Vienna, for example, my former university used Genway actively, uh, but um, I would love to, to hear more examples. Well, maybe I'll jump in. Uh, we indeed use Janeway here and have several uh, Diamond Open Access journals in our Janeway system. And that's why I asked, because it could be very interesting. So That's fantastic. Then I'm taking notes um, yeah. uh, because um, this can help also in future discussions with, with Janeway. They are, um, as mentioned, planning that. Um, okay. However, I, I don't know exactly when exactly this will happen. Yeah. I have to talk to our technical people, um, but um, I think the interest will be there, but not on a short term because they have a lot on their plate, but I'll certainly certainly talk to them uh, about the possibility and contact uh, Janeway on, on how this will proceed. 
Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Any more? The doc or anything? No. Uh, I'll take this opportunity while you're thinking of some some other burning questions, um, just for also a, a couple announcements. So um, first of all, uh, we are hosting um, the some first open air graph actual training. Um, we limited the training to 40 registrants as we only have two trainers, so they're able to handle everyone. So the training is actually full at the moment, but if you stay tuned, um, we'll have some materials regarding the training that you can access afterwards. Um, so here's just some more information on that. And we're going to be launching a lot more graph training um, uh, in the future as well. And then also uh, this month, we uh, kicked off the season two of the open air graph pod, or sorry, open air podcast um, with the mini series exploring the open air graph itself. So keeping it to short episodes, just diving into some general aspects, the overview of the graph and its uh, role in EOS, uh, general technical overview. Um, and then how it can be used in bibliometrics discovery and open science monitoring. So we've released so far episode one, we're going to release one episode each uh, week this month as kind of a back to school, back to work special. So you can listen to the, the first episode and then any of the older episodes as well, if you're interested. Um, uh, we can get the links to either Spotify or Apple podcasts here on the Open Aircraft website. So just a couple announcements and let's see if we have any more questions. Oh, we did have one from the registration form. I don't know if the person is here in the room, but uh, uh, we have a question on why persons uh, is not a materialized entity. Is it for GDPR issue? <laughs> this is in the... It's, it's it's a very nice uh, question, actually. The, the main thing is, uh, of course, a person is an entity and researchers are entities as part of the research ecosystem. The, the thing is that names uh, aren't unique and can change. Um, and this is why having a, only a name um, as an identifier, so to say, might lead to different um, issues. So the string per se is not unique. Um, I always do the, the test with my own name, uh, including uh, Paloma Marin uh, in, in, in Orchid. And my name is half common in Spain and my surname is also half common, uh, but there are five Paloma Marins at Orchid. With my second surname, then the thing uh, changed a bit, but in any case, it won't be that easy to, to identify people. Also in uh, English um, speaking uh, databases, we have the issue of including the first name and the last name available and the rest being middle names. Then we also have people changing, particularly women changing their surname when they get married in certain countries. Um, and uh, also maybe people that might change they, they, their um, a given name, either because they use a diminutive or any other um, any other uh, consideration. So at the end, um, that's the most important part of using an identifier. The GDPR aspect is not really connected to the name because names per se are not part of sensitive data as per uh, GDPR. Um, so I, I don't really see a relation there. Uh, it would be more the disambiguation part. I can try to give another angle to the interpretation of the question since we don't have, uh, I, I think we don't have the person who posted this question in the call, but uh, I mean, in case it relates to the materialization of person in the graph, which is true as for today, Today, we consider a person as part of the open air graph data model because also thanks to the collaboration with ORCID, it is because we can well identify authors, individuals of publications. 
but uh, right now it is not materialized in the data serialization that Opener provides. So it's not uh, possible through the API to get an answer that has uh, the authors and the list of its publications, like uh, in the way the data is organized in ORCID, for example. Instead, author, authors are uh, always available as properties of other entities, like uh, authors of publications. So you get the publications and then you can uh, access the author information, but we are still uh, getting at that by querying publications. Uh, I take this uh, answer to also remind that we have an ongoing activity in open air to uh, also export authors with uh, together with link information like their works uh, in the revamp that we mentioned uh, earlier in the previous answer uh, soon through the APIs and through uh, the other uh, materializations of the graph. Uh, at the moment, this uh, activity is in beta stage. Uh, these weeks, we are uh, finalizing some tests. So we hope by the end of, of this year to uh, conclude this activity. Thank you. Let's see uh, if we have any more questions. Check the document again. Okay. All right, looks like there's no more questions. So uh, thank you again, everyone for joining and thank you again, Paloma, for taking the time and giving us this wonderful presentation. Thank you for <laughs> and inviting me. And for all your, the answers to your questions, they're really, really helpful and insightful. Thank you. I will uh, complete some of them uh, in the document that I think you share with, uh, with all the calls uh, in case they are useful. And, and again, thank you very much for for having me representing ORCID in, in these community calls. Thank you for coming. And uh, everyone else, uh, and Plum as well, if you're interested, uh, stay tuned for our uh, next community call. Again, we're back on track after the summer break. So third Wednesday of every month, 11 to 12 CEST, we will be here. So, oh, oh we have uh, one question. Yes. So, um, yes, the training is already full and closed for the for the big query. Yes, we, we only have uh, this time we have two trainers um, giving the training. And so we have to limit the number of trainees, of course, for them to, to be able to give everyone their full attention and guidance. Um, but we will be hosting more trainings and we this uh, webinar will be recorded and we will provide all the materials relating to it afterwards as well. So we'll definitely, we'll be posting that on, uh, if you don't already follow the Open Air Graph Twitter, um, once those materials are live, um, we will be posting them. So you can follow that here, the Open Air Graph Twitter um, for any news and updates. Um, and then also, as always, our uh, user form. We have our user form, which we really encourage everyone to, um, if you have any questions, we of course have our help desk, but for quick questions for to speak directly with, well, of course the help desk, you'll be speaking also with the team, but any general questions, anything, feel free always to post in our user form and then uh, we'll, we'll be in contact. And also it's a space where the community can help each other as well. So you can share your own um, tips and tricks and, and everything. So I'll share both that and the Twitter here again. So you have those resources. Yes. And so, which I think was in the previous message, but just to be safe. There you go. So we'll be posting there um, when all those materials are available. And then for our next uh, training training sessions as well. All right, well, thank you again, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next month. Bye. Bye.